Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, final keynote controversy uh, discussion, The Good Society, Virtues for a Post-Recession World. To those of you uh, who I haven't met, I'm Claire Fox, and I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas. And um, before I introduce my panel, just to give you a bit of a sense of what we're talking about, uh, or what, what um, informed us thinking about this discussion, it was partly when in um, March, Gordon Brown, in response uh, to the economic crisis, said that he wanted society to return to the values, a uh, return to the values of the good society. And he then went on to talk about hard work and effort being valued alongside enterprise, honesty, and integrity. And it just made some of us think at the Institute of Ideas that there was a moment in this economic crisis where people were saying it's time to stop and reassess and work out a new set of values for society. And we thought that it would be useful to reflect on both that debate and the kind of values that are being discussed at the moment and also to consider um, what values we think society should be organised around. Um, Andrew uh, Lansley, uh, when Shadow Health Secretary, uh, said that the recession, infamously said the recession was good for us because people tend to smoke less, drink less alcohol and spend time at home with their families. And to a certain extent there has been, although that's a kind of a rather a, a, a silly example of a, an MP putting his foot in it, there has been a sense in which quite a lot of people have implied that the recession has become... Uh, is really payback time for a misplaced set of human values around greed, around an addiction to consumption, around materialism. And people assume that uh, we have uh, learned our lessons and that now we're going to be much more responsible, whether it's about um, how much we spend, about the climate. We're going to be much more interested in happiness and well-being than money, uh, that we all need to become more uh, sustainable and so on. So that's what we're going to play around with on the panel. It's obviously a very broad topic, and it's not fair to have almost asked my panel to deal with it in five to seven minutes, but that's what they're going to do, and then we're going to open it up to you. Um, obviously, there is always a danger with this, that when we open it up to you, then one just stands up and says, my values are these, and no disrespect at how interesting your values are, that's not really helpful. Um, uh, what we'd prefer is to actually assess what this debate's really about uh, in its context, as well as having some kind of future orientation at the uh, as we come to nearly the end of the Battle of Ideas, not the end uh, yet. Let me introduce my panel. The first thing I do have to say is that Tristan Hunt, uh, who was due to be with us, is not here uh, uh, because his wife has gone into labour, uh, which is a perfectly reasonable excuse in my book. Um, and, uh, uh, and therefore, we wish him well. Um, and, uh, we, but we have got a, a very able replacement who I'll introduce in a moment. But first of all, panel as uh, advertised, and who will be speaking first is Luke Johnson. Luke is the chairman of Channel 4 TV Corporation, has been since 2004, and uh, chairman of Risk Capital Partners private equity firm since 2001. Uh, he's also the chairman and owner of restaurant business Giraffe and P uh, Patisserie Valerie. Um, and uh, I'm excited by that because I like them. Um, and as chairman and, ma and majority shareholder of Signature Restaurants, he also built up Strada restaurant chain. Uh, and I like them too, so I thought I'd mention it. But anyway, that's kind of the sort of money is. Uh, he writes a weekly essay in the uh, Financial Times, which I know many of us in the Institute of Ideas read. Uh, he's the uh, governor of the University of Arts, or was governor of the University of Arts until 2006, in some ways, the University of Arts is the sort of rival of the Royal College of Arts, but he's left there, so we'll let him off. He's also the chair of the Royal Society of Arts, which might be a rival of the Institute of Ideas, but we like to think we're friends, unless Matthew and I have a spat. But um, Matthew Taylor runs the Royal Society of Arts, Luke is the chair, and anybody who knows the Royal Society of Arts will know that they have an exemplary programme of public debates, which actually we are admirers of and supporters of at the Institute of Ideas. So let's give Luke a warm welcome, please. Next, we have Professor Susan Nyman, who's director of the Einstein Forum in Berlin. She was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and studied philosophy at Yale and Tel Aviv University. And she's the author of, I think, a very important book, which, again, many of us have read and discussed and argued over, and it's certainly informed a lot of our thinking over the last uh, uh, six months or a year. And that book is uh, Moral Clarity, A Guide for Grown-Up Idealists. 
the very title of it implies that we think that um, you're a grown-up idealist and uh, we're delighted to have Susan here. She's come. <laughs> she, and the main thing is, is that she, uh, she was over in Britain early in the year and I didn't dare ask her to come back, but she very kindly did and we're absolutely delighted to have you. So thank you, Susan. Can we give her a warm welcome? Not travelled as far, um, but nonetheless important, is Brendan O'Neill. Uh, Brendan is the editor of Spiked. Uh, uh, Spiked is actually the partner of this particular session and has uh, worked very closely, obviously, with Spiked over the years at the Institute of Ideas. Uh, he's, uh, uh, one, uh, Spiked has been described by Nadine Strossen when she was president of the ACLU as one of those rare publications that defends free speech, even when it is difficult and unfashionable to do so. And I think Brendan has really made sure that Spiked is... Uh, at the forefront of the free speech debate in this country. He's the author of The Green Satire, Can I Recycle My Granny, and, and 39 Other Eco Dilemmas. Um, he started his career in journalism uh, at Spike's predecessor, Living Marxism, and its successor, LM, and that's where he and I worked together. He's a prolific journalist. I know that you will have read him, and it could be in anything from The New Statesman to The Spectator, across the left and right divide, uh, across the Atlantic in Salon or Slate or American Prospect, American Conservative or Reason, and anywhere and everywhere, and he's always on the radio. It's always great to have Brendan here. Can we give him a wel welcome? And then stepping into the breach for Tristram is uh, a, a, a good friend of the Institute of Ideas and indeed of public intellectual life in general. And I don't often say that about a member of parliament. Um, but it's Evan Harris. And Evan Harris is a former public health and hospital doctor. He's MP for Oxford West and Abingdon. He's a member of the Liberal Democrats National Policy Committee and is writing the manifesto for a post-recession Britain, very appropriately. And he campaigns on a number of areas, uh, medical ethics, free speech, science and secularism. And anyone who knows Evan will know that he uh, constantly challenges and provokes uh, public debate. And it is genuinely the case that he has actually been here visiting as a guest at the, uh, uh, the Battle of Ideas without speaking, which I think shows an admirable commitment to public debate and public engagement. And so I'm delighted he's now on the panel. Can we give Evan a big welcome, please? <laughs> okay, Luke, kick us off. Thanks. Um, in a sense, it's always been a post-recession world because human affairs are forever governed by boom and bust. And so mankind's perpetually either recovering from a downturn or heading into the upswing. And so it's my belief that life is not a stable experience. It's a roller coaster full of joy and pain. And to deny this cyclical aspect of existence is to embrace delusion and perpetual disappointment. And so I'm not really convinced that the virtues one requires now should be very different from those of last year or even the year before. Now, I think intellectual debate like this is wonderful, but I think action is ultimately much more important. And for all our concerns today about morality, what exhaustive research right across the globe by Gallup has shown is that what matters more to more people than anything else is having a good job. This is a very profound and immediate issue for perhaps two and a half million citizens here, certainly more next year, almost 10 million in America and hundreds of millions across the rest of the world. Abstract stuff about materialism and consumption is all very well. But for those out of work on Monday, finding a productive occupation is the key thing. It brings not just an income, but a purpose in life, dignity and independence. And from this position of strength in employment can flow the rather more highfalutin worries about the dangers of individualism or rampant greed. And so my very simple philosophy is that anything we can do to create or retain worthwhile jobs is a good and very powerful thing. Now, being abstemious, worrying about climate change, common civility to one's neighbours, participating in the community, contributing to charity, acting as a responsible parent, and so on, all these are very worthy causes to be applauded and indeed practised. But in any society without a bedrock of genuine paying work for a high proportion of able-bodied adults, then these things become much less pressing. Because workless people and I'm not talking about carers or child rearers, but those who have no occupation, whether they're on welfare or not, too often turn to despair, and high unemployment tends to lead to, amongst other things, broken homes, drug abuse, crime, and other ills. 
And I think perhaps the best method of bringing about job renewal in our system is simple optimism. Because optimism is the oxygen necessary for human progress. It leads to new inventions, new companies, new jobs, and a higher standard of living. Without this sense of a hope for the future, life is a grim affair, a sort of regression back to the dark ages. Now, this elemental lust for life is an amazing but intangible force. Such instinct cannot easily be understood through scientific endeavor, but it can surely be nurtured, and it's up to each of us every day to decide if we want to essentially look forward or look back. Now, important initiatives always require a leap of faith. I tend to find that a lot of those who are over-analytical or over-intellectual even struggle with real breakthroughs. They focus so much on the downsides, they forget about the potential of the sunlit uplands. When starting a new career or a new business, for example, there will always be the moment when you approach the precipice, all the material facts are un unknown, negotiations have exhausted everyone, and now for the decision. Do you take the plunge or do you walk away? Now, this year has been common to feel trapped in an almost universal mood of gloom. I've certainly had my moments of despondency. But depressing predictions do not allow for the relentless tide of mankind's ingenuity and the sheer power of positive thinking. I cannot account for it, but enthusiasm, will, and force of personality can achieve remarkable feats. Now, there's no room for complacency, and no one said achieving anything is easy, but I believe there are solutions out there to our problems whether they be imagined or real. Now, plenty have suffered setbacks in recent times, but the vast majority will recover. And short of death or prison, such reverses can be overcome in time. Giving up is always the ultimate tragedy. And as someone once said, unless you've lost a limb or your house is on fire, then your difficulties are just inconveniences. Plan for, the f plan for failure or disaster and you will surely not be disappointed. But if you concentrate on your strengths and apply yourself, then something heroic might emerge. And that sense of adventure, a sense of discovery, a will to achieve something positive, that matters. I really believe that retaining the ultimate confidence in our capabilities of human beings is vital. We need to keep that almost innocent faith that tomorrow will be a better day. Because in the long run, history has shown that the pessimists are always on the losing side. It's not just that they are depressing to be around. It's that they underestimate our resourcefulness. Invention and free enterprise are intangible but vital assets, and without them, I think we're sunk. If society turns against risk takers and adopts an obsessively over-regulated and overtaxed safety-first attitude, then we will regress. But if we continue to believe in things like technology and a spirit of entrepreneurialism, then anything is possible. As Teddy Roosevelt, one of my favorite American presidents said, far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in a gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. Thank you. Luke doesn't know this yet, and he might be horrified, but you sound like you're a member of the Institute of Ideas, Luke. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you very much indeed. Susan. We were actually asked to prepare uh, short statements not related to, or not knowing much of what our co-panelists were going to say. I do want to say a word um, to Luke, because um, I entirely agree with you that a job should bring, uh, besides a steady income on which one can feel um, satisfied and independent, um, it should bring a purpose in life. And for those of us who get flown around to speak in front of public audiences and write books and um, turn out in talk shows, of course it does. Um, it can also be the case for carpenters and for teachers and bakers and nurses and all kinds of things. But I think we have to get real and I'm acknowledge. Baker. I, you know, I like to cook. I don't do it professionally, but. Um, 
Uh, I think we have to get real and acknowledge that for most people in the world, jobs don't bring a purpose in life, and that one thing that has to be thought about is reconstructing the entire notion of work in a globalized economy. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. Um. <laughs> and there's a work strand of debates on it, but it's in another room. So right, anyway, right, right, right. Um, I wanted to start by questioning the question that I was sent, um, namely, should we adopt post-recession virtues that will reconcile us to less ambition, less freedom, less capacity to shape society? And the question is simply, well, wait, which ambition, which freedom, and which capacity to shape society? Let's get real. I have at least two good friends, uh, men of extreme wealth, one inherited and one self-made, who have used their wealth to shape society in extraordinarily interesting and, and uh, idealistic ways, and I'm sure there are many others. Just as I know um, at least two people who's, uh, without wealth whose lives I would call heroic, they spend their lives taking great risks to shape society, but most of us, with or without wealth, don't. Um, and so I, I am concerned about that equation, that somehow earning wealth and having ambition, freedom, and the ability to shape society somehow go together. Um, they very often don't. Second, the question of uh, whether we need a different set of values didn't start with the recession. And here I agree very much with uh, Luke. I mean, the recession happened a year ago. The question came up uh, a great deal in the much maligned 60s. It was dropped for a while. And it was raised again most strongly with the rise of fundamental terrorism, which we know from all the empirical studies, does not come from a lack of material welfare. The people who commit terrorist acts, by and large, know, could have, and don't want the values of the consumerist West. So I think it's really important to ask what do they want and what do we want? The gap between real happiness and virtue, virtue understood as idealistic engagement in the service of something other than your own well-being, is not nearly as large as it's often suggested. I look at happiness as an enlightenment value, and uh, that means that it has moral worth. Of course, happiness and virtue sometimes clash. I'm not a stoic. But in most lives, day to day, they come together. Again, the Enlightenment raised most of the problems that uh, we need to be thinking out about today, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau raised the question of false needs and consumerism and pointed out that actually every new invention brings less happiness in itself than losing it brings unhappiness. A simple example, what happens when, do, do you wake up in the morning and appreciate your internet? Probably not. I mean, many of us at this point also curse it. But what happens when it's on the blink? I mean, you know, you're miserable when you lose it. Um, it's not likely that you are really grateful for having it. And Rousseau pointed this out 250 years ago. Um, more things uh, after you've reached a certain decent level of, of well-being is not normally what brings us happiness. When the Enlightenment identified happiness as a right, given certain kinds of um, other kinds of virtues, it was a de demand for happiness for everyone. A virtuous man should not have to steal bread to feed his family, um, opposed to a pre-modern view that held the poor always with us. Um, disease is not God's punishment. It's something that ought to be within human capacity to um, um, combat. If the world doesn't provide happiness, it's up to us to change things. But with the notion of happiness as a right, our very notion of hap what happiness is changes. Happiness becomes not passive consumption, uh, a la when I get to heaven I'll have take your pick, um, 70 virgins. Um, Jews, interestingly enough, insofar as we portray notions of heaven, portray it as a constant Talmudic discussion. Um, you know, days of wine and roses. I have nothing against, you know, time in the tropics as a time out, but I believe very strongly that to be human is to be active, to refuse to accept the given world as given, to want to shape 
reality and indeed to want to give something back to creation for the gift of being able to live in it. Um, a couple of words about terrorism. It's no secret that Osama bin Laden is admired by his admirers precisely for the fact that he gave up a life of great wealth and passive consumption. Now, when I was in um, Western Africa a few years ago, people were selling T-shirts of Osama bin Laden all over the place. I gather they've been replaced, interesting enough, by Obama T-shirts. And I think the reason that they have been replaced by Obama t-shirts is not simply because Obama has inspired um, a sense of idealism around the world that we're um, happy uh, was satisfied in the world. Obama's happy. <laughs> and the idea that if you work hard, do right, um, and uh, take a few risks, you actually not only get to do good in the world, but um, you live a life that shines for other people, is one of great power and influence. Empirical research shows that happiness is not usually uh, gained by, uh, there was a bumper sticker a while ago, he who dies with the most toys wins but by having certain kinds of meaning in your life. Um, you know, from the Beatles who sang Can't Buy Me Love to um, anybody who's ever thrown themselves into uh, work for something that went on beyond their own, um, own well-being. We all know this. We all know, as a Polish friend of mine, a writer who was very engaged in Solidarność, said, you know, it was better than really good sex. Okay. Um, once again, nothing against good sex, good food, the good life. Uh, I think one of the things that actually stops us asking idealistically, uh, acting idealistically is an all-or-nothing view, the idea that if you don't devote your entire life to saving the world, uh, whatever you do isn't worth it. And again, you want to say, well, where did we get that idea? Uh, I think it's quite possible to believe that a chance to enjoy the beauties of creation um, is crucial to being human, um, may even provoke promote the virtue of gratitude. If we know all these kinds of truths, which can sound almost sappy or banal when we hear them, what stops us from asking? And I want to simply close by saying, I think the biggest thing that stops us from acting is a sense of embarrassment. Words like virtue, idealism, nobility, heroism, which Luke, I, I was pleased to see, just used. Um, tend to be taken up by the right. They have also been um, abused by the right. And there's a tendency to therefore uh, distance ourselves from them. But uh, I want to raise the question, which I hope will come up in the discussion, whether or not when as has become an international trend, when you say noble or good or evil, and put them in scare quotes, um, whether really trying to distance yourself from using those ideas in full voice and what it is that you're embarrassed about simply saying. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Susan. That was so thought-provoking. Thank you. No, 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 not at all. Um, Brendan, your thoughts, please. Uh, thanks, Claire. Um, Throughout history, uh, social crises have tended to be explained through the idea of decadence. You know, when society reaches a tipping point or enters a crisis period or falls apart, there has been a historical tendency to interpret the problem through the prism of excess and opulence. It's become a kind of default and quite unsatisfactory explanation for historical crises. You know, right from biblical times through to today, there has been this idea of society being corrupted by excessive greed. 
So, for example, you know, one of the most popular images from the crisis and collapse and demise of Rome is of Nero playing the fiddle and drinking wine during the Great Fire. Uh, you know, one of the best-known legends of the collapse of feudalism is of Marie Antoinette of France saying, let them eat cake. You know, that quote uh, might not be accurate, but the idea of society being propelled towards a state of collapse by the greed of its rulers is a recurring one and, and a very powerful one. Excessive greed becomes both a symbol of and an explanation for a social crisis. The idea of a lack of restraint, a lack of control, becomes an explanation for why society itself is spinning out of control and entering a period of turmoil. The problem, of course, is that this default explanation is far too partial and narrowly uh, moralistic. And it can even serve as a distraction from understanding the larger social and economic forces that bring about crisis and social collapse. And yet today, people are putting forward very similar default explanations for the economic, social, and moral malaise afflicting the society that, that we live in. You know, according to the title of one new book, we live in an age of greed. Uh, the modern day uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is now seen as the kind of the square mile in the city of London. You know, society has been wrecked, we're told, by the excessive greed and decadence of bankers in particular. And, you know, over the past year, we've been treated to detailed stories about how much these people spend on booze, how many times they visit lap dancing clubs, what they eat for lunch and dinner and everything else, you know, in a very kind of Caligulan way. And the idea of, of decadence causing social collapse has returned with a vengeance. And, uh, of course, it remains as partial and unsatisfactory an explanation as ever. However, if we, were, if we were just witnessing the return of the kind of slightly narrow decadence argument, that would be pretty bad. But, but it's, there's something worse than that. There is something new and unusual and darker in today's focus on greed as the destroyer of society. What is different today is that it's not only the rich and the rulers and the fat and the, you know, the opulent whose greed is said to have caused turmoil. Instead, all of us, every single one of us, is implicated in the age of greed. It's not just the modern-day Marie Antoinette who have apparently ruined everything. Instead, we're all apparently complicit in the destruction of society through our lack of restraint and our uh, uh, lack of control. I think this is unusual and, and also uh, deeply disturbing. So today, everyone from Fred Goodwin to Chinese peasants is complicit. So alongside attacks on Fred Goodwin's bonus, you will also read article after article telling us that the fact that Chinese people eat more meat is bringing about an historic food crisis. You know, alongside denunciations of bankers' fast cars and champagne lifestyle, you'll also hear denunciations of the fact that more Chinese and Indian people are buying refrigerators, which will apparently you know, contribute to global warming and bring about the end of days. Alongside attacks on bankers' for making money from thin air, you'll also see attacks on low-income families who took out mortgages even though they couldn't really afford them. You know, uh, how dare these poor people buy their homes? Uh, you know, who do they think they are? How dare Chinese people eat meat? You know, let them eat rice. That is the kind of miserablest slogan of today. And what we end up with as a result of this new, I think, spreading of the decadence argument to everyone is a demand for restraint amongst all sections of uh, the population, a demand for restraint as a solution to society's problems. And, uh, but even here, I think, even in this demand for restraint, there is something new and distinctive going on. Because today, uh, we're told to rein ourselves in, not in the name of redemption, or as a way of improving our moral and intellectual selves, but simply in order to stop being so destructive. You know, today there is a real palpable disconnect between any discussion of human behavior and any idea of human uh, redemption. Because in history, movements that encouraged aesthetic living or simple living, they always tended to be linked to some philosophical worldview, some idea of making human beings better by testing them and developing them and building their character. You know, for the Puritans and the Victorians and others, hardship had something to do with redemption, something to do with rede redeeming human beings. But, but now, the, the calls for cutting back are not linked to any positive human objective. 
It's not about character building. It's about completely external numerical things like reducing how many toxins you produce and how large your carbon footprint is. It's not about developing the human. It's about punishing the human in the name of some external force, usually Gaia or some other nonsense entity. You know, the, the, the ancient Greek philosopher Diogenes lived in a barrel because he wanted to achieve purity of thought. Uh, today, I'm not saying we should all live in barrels, by the way, but today, today we're encouraged to live in the contemporary equivalent of a barrel, you know, a small eco-home with not much heat and not too many amenities, merely to keep us in our place, merely to separate us from our environment and to stop us from being so destructive. So there's been a real displacement of people's interests, people's material interests, and also the idea that they are moral beings who have some uh, relationship with the world beyond being toxic. And I think these ideas, this idea that everyone is now complicit in decadently bringing down society, the idea that we should lower our living standards without any promise of redemption, really springs from a really degraded view of people. It springs from a view of people as simply consumers, exploiters, the users of resources, rather than people as creators, producers, uh, the makers of things and the makers of history. And in terms of the values we should hold dear post-recession, I, I, I agree with the other speakers. I don't think it's wise to draw up a list of values as if it were some administrative task. But we should definitely turn on its head the idea that a lack of restraint explains all of our social problems and the idea that human beings are simply sucking the planet dry when, in fact, if we had the chance, we'd be humanizing it and making it in our own image. Thanks so much, Brendan. And finally, we have... Thank you. I always feel I ought to apologize at events like this that I'm not Vince Cable. Uh, he fact, was here yesterday. In fact, it's all right. I'm, the, I'm the opposite, but as, as Claire said, I've, I came just to... Uh, Hear the, hear the talks, and essentially I've paid £80 for the privilege of being thrown in the deep end <laughs> at an hour's notice. Um, but, but um, That's the only time we're clapping you. But, this, but I was attracted, actually, uh, by the blurb in the introductory part, in the introduction to this, uh, the rather depressing blurb in the introduction to this, <laughs> these talks, because I kind of, uh, uh, my sort of esteemed quote from a, a great sage is, is from Woody Allen when he said in I think Annie Hall that, that life is divided into the, the horrible and the miserable and the horrible are people who are suffering and in pain with great angst and the miserable is everyone else and so you, when you should go through life you should be happy you're miserable and um, uh, one of the questions we need to first address is, is when is post-recession if we want to be specific about this uh, does it mean when we get growth presumably that will be announced uh, soon and then adjusted and then re-announced or, or is it when, when unemployment falls, because there's this time lag? And, and it's a big question about whether we're going to... If it's valuable to talk about having a post-recession world, whether we're talking about an economic figure or where we, whether we're talking about the lives of real people. And I would say that we need to postpone thinking about the, the post-recession world till, we're, till people's lives are, are, are better and, and unemployment starts to fall. Um, but the question is... Our, our, the political question is, can we go back to how it was before? And I think there are two honest positions on this. Um, uh, the position I hold is actually, the, is, I think is honest, but it's not quite as honest as, as the other one, which is Boris Johnson's, um, which is the one put, postulated by Compass, among others, and, and, and my colleagues, which is that <coughs> we can't go back, uh, despite what's been said by, uh, on this panel, we can't go back to the values of economics as it, or, or finance as it was before, making everything that we rely on or so much of what we rely on so dependent on the money markets, uh, deregulated money markets, where we just trust that there will be um, oh, a trickle-down. Um, I'm trying to think of a, of a urological uh, uh, metaphor for trickle-down, but, but something flowing down from above from these uh, finances as they play the markets, that we can't go back to that and that we should seize the opportunity. And that's why I don't know whether that's true or not, but I, politically I want to, you, to take on that argument to say that I think we should go for a more egalitarian world and there will be politicians who are seeking uh, from good, from good uh, motives to, to do that, whether or not that's right. Boris's position is, 
is an honest one, which says, no, we rely on the city to make London and Britain rich, and that if we are seen to regulate it more than other countries, uh, then we will lose out, and so that you get this Dutch auction again of deregulation. I think that the Cameron Brown position in the middle uh, is, is, is not so uh, honest, where they claim that they don't want to go back to the way things are, were, but actually aren't proposing anything significant, and are just, uh, I think, flattering to deceive. Um, uh, one example is the refusal uh, to use the public share that we have in these banks to get them to lend, uh, partly because we want them to build up their balance sheets so we can sell them uh, back so we can get the money for public spending, but it's still uh, a, a, a dishonest proposition that, yes, we own huge shares in these banks, but we're not prepared to use that in a positive way. I was struck by Andrew Lansley's uh, quote, which is that, uh, that the recession will be good for the broken society because people uh, who are depressed will drink less. <coughs> I mean, I, that's out of touch, I think, and that family breakdown will be prevented by people spending more time with their family. And they haven't <laughs> seen my family. Uh, <laughs> I think the broken society, if it exists, is a consequence, and it's a continuum, it's not suddenly snapped, of a gap between, a growing gap between rich and poor. Uh, regardless of relative wealth, they are growing apart. So we are seeing a ghettoization, like one sees in the United States, increasing, and there has been a failure to improve social mobility. So one of the things I think we should be arguing for, and I don't think it should be an exclusively leftist position, although I'm pleased if it is, is that we should be seeking to close that gap and improve social mobility. Um, I want to make a, a, an analysis, a comparison with the crisis in politics, just to show how fickle I think uh, and how fleeting the opportunity is. With all this um, expenses stuff, uh, there was quite rightly a cri and is a crisis in politics and that will have some negative effects as some of the uh, sessions that there have been this weekend have said if people just abstain then uh, it, 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 that's not a good thing and that we should sign up to politics but the opportunity was there to say that this happens when people who are representative think they have and do have safe seats so an end to safe seats would keep everyone as much on their toes as me and can I say that Oxford is full of the people living in metaphorical barrels and one thing I won't do even to please the Institute of Ideas is slag them off because I do have a marginal seat and, and I think they're wonderful, <laughs> they're wonderful uh, sack, uh, hair shirt people and uh, I will join them uh, <laughs> in next May. Um, the, uh, but so we've got this crisis in politics and there's a real opportunity because there's a failure of parliament to, to hold government to account. MPs are not only doing extremely, do extremely dodgy things, and they were, uh, and I don't think they have any excuse, most of them, for what they did, but they also weren't doing a good job as, as parliamentarians. The government uh, runs parliament, which is wrong. Parliament should assert itself, because the government is only the payroll, it shouldn't be the whole of it, and we have an opportunity with the Reform Committee of Parliament, which I'm on, to change this for a generation or generations to say, Parliament will decide what we debate, not the government. Parliament will set the agenda. Government will have time to get its, its, all its criminal justice bills before the House, but we will decide what we vote on, and we won't rely only on the House of Lords to have the crucial debates and votes. 42 days never, never came to us, for example. And we're going to uh, strengthen select committees. Now, the problem is that we will report in November, and I fear greatly that this will just be ignored by the government or the would-be government because they know it will make life difficult for them. And it's going to be extremely difficult to force that change, even in such a clear and obvious way, on a parliament that needs to assert itself for its own sake. And I fear the same will happen post-recession, that we will not, we, there will be a confusion, because I agree with what Luke said about the need to reward risk. So I'm not arguing that we shouldn't reward risk. The problem is that there was a win-win situation in the city previously, that you could, you could make bad decisions which led to failure and still be rewarded. So we reward failure in this country, and yet we don't have the same thing. Uh, we, we reward failure in some terms, but then we over-punish failure in other terms. We don't have the Chapter 11 protection that, that the United States have. We are, by design, less entrepreneurial, and so we, everything is working against long-term sustainable growth as well as the political cycle that we work in. Finally, we're not going to solve this unless we return to the politics of politics and not the politics of personality. And what's so depressing, I find, that's why I'm miserable, 
is that we are the key debate at the next election is going to be will we see the leaders okay i don't give i don't care about the leaders <laughs> any of them uh, it's the policies that count and it's even worse now because it's not about the leaders we've got this business of leaders wives uh, at party conferences the political equivalent of readers wives and just as <laughs> and 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 just as sort of one step removed symbols of virility it's and we have this culture of celebrity. You see these middle-aged MPs chasing on College Green Joanna Lumley, some calling her absolutely fabulous, others more worryingly calling her purdy and demanding a photograph. Absolutely, um, but nevertheless, it did change the policy. But the sad thing is that the politics should have changed the policy, not the personality. And I fear that while we're riven by personality and whether we have a leader's debate where the, the five o'clock shadow of, of a leader's wife is worse than another, uh, it, it's going to decide who people vote for. It's going to decide who people vote for. We're not going to concentrate on whatever the values that we should have post-recession, whatever the policies we have uh, post-recession. Finally, I'd like to leave you, I always say this, with a, with a positive message. I don't have one. I'd like you to take two negative messages instead. Quick, Woody Allen quick, again. Quick. And I've given them to you. Let's get rid of personality. I, I fear we're going to lose out to personality, and I fear we're not going to have an honest discussion of what we should do post-recession. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to go out actually quite quickly to the audience. I, I just because it's a, a while since we we heard from Luke. I just wanted to go back to you on one thing, Luke. You you, you almost implied, um, you know, you you know, it's all very well having these highfalutin intellectual debates, but you know, as a man of action, and then went on to say. But actually, one of the things that's concerned us, which is why we've organised this particular debate, is is that that there's been a, a, a shift intellectually, for example, in a belief in progress or a belief in economic growth. We had a session yesterday on, eco on, on economic growth, and basically it's become mainstream to just simply say economic growth is a problem, right? I mean, amongst leading economists, amongst thinkers, amongst intellectuals, but actually also amongst doers, amongst businessmen, and amongst all sorts of people. So it, we actually do have to win some intellectual arguments. And some of what you said actually goes against the grain of what's being said today by a lot of people in your own field. Uh, well, I'm not convinced that most of the people I meet in the world of enterprise are against growth. Um, but they don't argue for it very vigorously. Well, these days. that may be true. I think business often, capitalism as a rule, doesn't really make its case well enough. Um, and too many intellectuals are from the left because... More often than not, they feed at the teat of the state. So that's the inevitable consequence. Uh, the truth is that, um, you know, I think real people care about making progress and advances in their lives because an awful lot of them aren't as spoiled as us. So they actually want to have a better standard of living. And why is that a bad thing? Well, no, but I don't think it is. But what I'm saying is it's become discredited very broadly. And I even went to a Times debate which was, had a lot of bankers at it and a lot of business people, sort of off the re this was off the record, they were all saying, it's terrible, nobody, you know, we're being attacked and nobody will go out and argue. And then let's split the room. Half of the people in the room started saying, well, we have, we have got too much economic growth, we've been too materialistic. And I ended up as the ex-Marxist standing up, say, or not even ex, the Marxist standing up saying, I believe in economic prosperity, I believe, you know, the rest of it. And they're going, oh, do you? Well, I think it's all gone horribly wrong. And we, aren't we destroying the planet? I mean, it was ridiculous. Anyway, uh, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I think an awful lot of the bankers, uh, you know, I think there's much wrong with the financial services industry, but I think, you know, a lot, a lot of them are moral cowards anyhow because they won't even stand up and defend their practices or explain them. So, you know, they can't expect more than criticism, can they? Okay, uh, Susan, you were going to come in. Well, I agree that we should turn this over to the audience, so I won't go on except once again to question the um, assumption that progress and economic development are the same thing. I deeply agree with you that progress has become um, um, an extremely questionable word in all kinds of circles, and, and certainly more those on the left and elsewhere. But um, whoever said, except a very, very no narrow group of um, entrepreneurs, I mean, very narrow-minded, I'm not saying that every entrepreneur thinks this, that progress and economic development are the same thing. They're just not. Well, that's one for the audience, isn't it? Because I want to answer it, but I won't. Um, Brendan, what's, what's your... I mean, because you were actually implying there was more of a relationship there. 
or, or and the, actually our rejection of anyway, you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I think there has been a rejection of both of, of those things. You know, there, there is a great suspicion about progress as an idea. Um, and there is a profound cultural, political hostility to economic growth. You know, it's now discussed as almost entirely as something destructive, as something which has a terrible impact on the environment because of what I was talking about, which is the devaluation of human interests and any idea of what uh, would constitute a good human society. I think I just want to say something on, on quickly on Evan's point. Where he talk, I, I really agree with Evan about the crisis of politics, and the, which is a key problem in relation to the recession because there has been no serious deep, profound discussion about the... Instead, there's just been this firefighting where they, they kind of throw a few billion dollars here and then hope to forget about it. There's no serious discussion about what the solution should be or what the problem was in the first place. But I think the crisis of politics is more profound than Evan uh, allowed. I'm even more depressed than you are, actually, because it's not that politicians have opportunistically decided to become celebrities because they think they'll win more votes. There's a pre-existing hollowing out of politics, a collapse of political belief and political principle, which the vacuum of which is then filled by all this kind of bizarre celebrity stuff. So the politics of crisis is very deep. And uh, we need to address it seriously if we're going to hope to have any uh, future after the recession, I think. And just, just to ask you, um, uh, Evan, actually, just the, one of, the, sorry, I forget. One of the, the things that we noted in all of the literature in relation, not just the recession, but it's really come to the forefront, is, is that it's the, there has become a profoundly anti-humanistic uh, debate going on. I mean, the, this is one of the things that all of the... Um, Speakers, in a way, have talked about, you know, what human ingenuity or human creativity or, you know, human progress or whatever. But actually, a lot of the discussion is we as humans have messed it up, you know, and there's kind of pessimism there. So I know you were pessimistic about politics, which I understand. But do you recognise, especially because of your work in science, that there's quite a big rejection of the human enterprise of moving society forward and solving problems in this? It's almost like we've got to stop. And some of the uh, anti, um, you know, globalization, anti-bankers, and all those kind of things. It literally is, we need to stop and go back. We went too fast. Do you recognize some of that in your political? Um, yeah, yes, yeah. but there's conflicts and confusion because everyone's waiting for economic growth because it means we're out of recession. So I don't recognize, I mean, there must be some commentators who say, no, let's not have economic growth, let's stay in recession. Because the literal definition of recession, the definition of recession is no economic growth or negative economic growth for a number of quarters. So, but I think there is, I have to believe, there's a genuine dis difference to be had between economic growth and sustainable growth. Uh, which, one that, where you can improve living standards without unsustainably using up resources of the planet. Now, I know that's controversial because people will think that's just a, a get out, but there are prices to pay in terms of taxes on pollution in order to deliver that. But if you can do that, then that's clearly a model that has been managed for a while in other European countries. It's not just some <coughs> Nirvana. You just have to go to Scandinavia and some northern European countries to see that they're making much more progress in that. In terms of uh, Britain, compared to the United States, people always see the negative in technological development. The mobile phone mast nonsense. Uh, is just one example that instead of mobile telephony being seen as something that is good, except in meetings like this when they ring, it's, it's seen as a, a threat, a negative thing, and you get these stories about the, the dangers. And, and you don't get that in the US, maybe because, well, uh, it's, it's gone now, I think, but there will be the next scare story. And there's this industry that's lined up to lament uh, scientific advance and require scientists to seek permission before they do research, this upstreaming stuff that I'm kind of dubious about, uh, because they, people think that Parliament isn't doing a job or isn't, can't be relied on to do a job to, to regulate this, and that may be true, but I think the, the, the negativity towards those sort of things is totally unjustified, and you just have to look at the number of people, uh, I'm going off the subject now, who, who you know, believe in astrology or, 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 or stuff like that. It's, it's very depressing, don't get me started. Yes, okay, all right, um, hands in the air. Oh yes, that's a number. Um, okay, right, so people with microphones, there's a, there's a man in the middle and then you. There's a, yes, well, the man next to the person with the yellow hat on, then the person with the yellow hat on, then you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Could you stand up, please? It's for the camera people, apparently. Thank you very much, yes. My, um, my question is related to something that uh, Brendan brought up, which is the um, degradation of the view of the, 
uh, of individuals, if you like. And uh, I just wanted to observe that right across this weekend, um, there's been a lot of um, debates that actually concern that very issue, whether it be privacy, public services, politics. And so if you take that as red, which I would, um, I'd be interested to know what the panel thought could be done about it and what their explanation would be for why it's come about. Okay, thank you. The person next to you, yeah. I guess this might be a bit similar, but um, I found what Evan said really depressing, um, saying that uh, we're basically going to lose out to personality at the next election and there's not much we can do. I'm, a, like him, an 80 quid ticket buyer. I come here to be inspired and to kind of... Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know what to do. Um, I feel really disenfranchised and a bit like crying. <laughs> Um, I don't want this to turn into a therapy session, despite that. No disrespect, and I will talk to you later and try and inspire. So don't just do some big inspiring thing now, just to kind of get a vote. Anyway, yes, uh, yeah. Um, listening to Luke was like um, tuning into Oprah there for a bit. The whole kind of like, you know, aren't we just great, we're amazing, just chin up, all the rest. So basically, the pull your socks up argument for economic development. Um, and it's, it's really uh, the, the eulogizing from Luke and Brendan about human creativity and human dynamism. Yeah, people are amazing creative organisms. We're also really mediocre and stupid in exactly the same measure. And, um, and, and why is it that so much economic growth has to entail um, an economy, which, a global economy, which is, uh, basically produces complete crap? You know, so much stuff out there in the shops is rubbish. You know, wh why can't it, the economy be directed in a way that provides real substantial human improvement? And not just, wh why can't it be something more than just another pizza chain? You know? <laughs> okay, yeah, no, right. That's, that's almost like the perfect question for the Institute of Ideas, because actually these are the things we think about all the time. Right, a uh, person uh, down, I can see a hand, but I obviously can't see the person. Yes, that hand there, then the hand right at the back, then I'll come to the panel, then I'll come back to you two uh, gentlemen in the front. The, the other dimen dimension of uh, the contemporary anti-materialist miserablists is their rather hostile view of freedom uh, that goes with it. I think a lot of the attacks on consumption uh, maybe dressed up in environmentalist wrappings, but at root, I think there's an irritation with enlarged personal freedom that an increase in wealth brings. This, I think, was why conservatives in the 1960s were very hostile to uh, the increased living standards of that period, because they knew instinctively uh, that it created a less fixed and a less stable society, albeit in a very uh, restricted and diminished way. But I think the good society doesn't involve drinking less, jogging more and spending more time with the family. But I think what American President Lyndon Johnson promoted uh, as the call for more prosperity and more liberty, as this was one politician who understood that liberty is the flip side of uh, prosperity. So I think if more UK politicians promoted the good, the good society in that way, I think that would be uh, a much more appropriate place to start. Okay, thank you. And there was a person at the back. Oh, yes, you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was unclear from all of the panel, really, what the virtues are that I should adopt. Because um, I felt it, all, it, quite, it really turned into a bit of a sociological analysis um, or a you know, historical discussion. But are, are you saying, for example, if I'm, if I'm depressed about the recession, should I just be kind? Should I, if someone upsets me, should I just say, are you okay? You know, that, is that the morality I should adopt and that might assist me to get through some of the problems that the post-depression world is throwing up? Or should I adopt a more public um, morality? I don't know what that might involve, but it might involve a bit of kindness, um, but perhaps a bit of cruelty. And maybe, is uh, Brendan, for example, saying that it's okay for, to be cutthroat and cruel uh, if that's what, that's what it takes to go forward? So I kind of wanted people to step back a bit more and say, what are these virtues and what's the public and private relationship between them in order to take me forward um, into, the, into this new world. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of what is the, the word for me to stand up and get criticise you and you criticise me back. Is the, what is that virtue called? I don't know, but I mean, maybe it's really simple or maybe I'm missing it, but 
maybe that's we need to invent a new word to, dis to, to describe what we need to be doing in our relationships with each other. Okay, thanks. So just pick anything up, uh, Luke, that you want to, uh, just any one of those or any bits. Well, the question, uh, the question about why don't we have a more directed economy, I guess the obvious answer is who the hell directs it? And where are the success stories of command economies? I mean, the more extreme versions are, you know, South Korea or fascism. If you want liberty and if you want choice, uh, then you have to offer, you know, a variety of things out there. And your opinion of what's rubbish may be quite different to someone else's. The marketplace is pretty good at sorting that out, actually. And uh, I'm sure everyone here loves pizza, you know. It's not that bad. In China lately, I mean, it's just not true. Um, to the woman who said she was, had paid 80 pounds and was depressed, um, there's an awful lot that could be said, but I, I, I myself wanted to ask why the Woody Allen quote in the same way that I've um, sometimes wanted to ask why Freud said the goal of psychoanalysis was to turn uh, extraordinary n uh, neurosis into common unhappiness, why those are the alternatives. Um, I, I have to say, I don't believe you. I think pessimism is fashionable, and I think it's part of, it's one of the things that we're actually embarrassed about. With all worries about Oprahizing the world, okay? Um, I, I think we need to ask ourselves why we're embarrassed not to be pessimistic. The problem with Oprah, who does a lot of good things, let's not knock her, um, is that she never questions the framework in which she urges people to pull up their socks and get together, uh, get it together. I think we both need to pull up our socks and to question the framework. And finally, to the gentleman who asked a very good question about what virtues he's supposed to be thinking about. Um, well, I've actually written a book about that subject that came out in Britain in, in the summer. So um, I don't want to go on for too long, but the virtue that, well, I, I mean, I can, but there are four of us here. So, you know, um, don't want to hog the mic here. Um, when you ask, what's the virtue that allows me to step back and take a look at myself and what I'm doing from a different point, it's called reason. We don't need a, need a new name for it. We do need to understand reason differently. And I thought your question about the difference between public and private morality was in particular a good one, but I, I think the goal is a way of living in the world that um, works in both ways. That is, that doesn't simply say, if I'm going to do great things in public or, or larger things in public, then I have to be unkind in private, although an awful lot of people act that way and vice versa. I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I think the questions you raised are exactly the, white, the right ones. Okay, thanks. Um, to the young woman in the yellow hat who I made to feel like crying. If it's any consolation, you're not the first woman that... Uh, well, anyway. Uh, the, um, but let's just look at this issue, if I may, about personality in politics. At one level, actually, it's rational for the media to have recognised how important the personality of party leaders is, because in two of the three parties, and I'm not trying to be party political here, and I lament this with my friends in the other parties, Two of the three parties, there is no policy making that comes from party membership. It's laid down by the man, usually a man at the top, and therefore their personality is important if we want to know what the policies are that will be proposed for the government that may govern us. And I think that's deeply sad. So the solution, if I can try and be constructive, is, is that we should urge the parties to restore internal party democracy so that people with ideology make policies rather than leaders advised by spin doctors or urged by donors make the policy. It's, it's very, very dangerous. And, and it's, Nick Griffin's a good example. It's all about Nick Griffin. And no mention of the fact that the swamp, this is my view, the swamp in which he, he swims has been created by the likes of Home Secretaries talking about bogus asylum seekers and people coming and swamping local public services and stuff. And, and I regret my own party's not as strong about pointing that out as it could be in the, in the recent uh, past. And to answer the question about what are the, the values, I mean, again, speaking personally, my values are freedom, equality, if you like, social democracy, environmentalism, internationalism, 
um, and, and those sorts of things. And obviously, you know, I work, I'm elected to a policy committee to try and put those into practice. But beyond that, we then need for the policies that emerge to be rational and effective, i.e. what works. I think there's a, there's a limit to ideology and, and it's very important that, uh, for example, politicians take advice from scientists on those small number of areas where there is an evidence base to guide us. But that doesn't mean an end to ideology. Ide there's, there's plenty of scope for both. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brendan? Um, on the question of, you know, why does our economy produce so much crap, you know, like pizzas and, and all that kind of stuff, I think it, it, that's not as radical a question as the question asker might think. You know, throughout history, people have always asked, you know, why, do, why are we producing so much crap and why do people buy so much crap? And, uh, and there's, there's always been an attack on conspicuous consumption and the, particularly uh, the, the buying of useless kind of extravagant things. But what's shocking today, as I was saying earlier, I think, which is really worth... worth it bears thinking about is that the attack on conspicuous consumption is now made across society. So it's not just aimed at those who have really expensive things and loads of stuff. It's aimed at everyone. You know, even the poorest people in Britain can be attacked for buying, you know, a 25-pound jacket or for, uh, you know, buying different kinds of trainers or, 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 or cars or whatever else they save up for. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, in the past, the attacks on conspicuous consumption were based on some kind of worldview which you know, on the idea that it would be better if there was more equality and if everyone could afford to have a decent life, you know, what Susan described as the kind of enlightenment outlook. But now, when it's kind of spread across the board so that all forms of consumption are demonised, I think it really speaks to a kind of collapse of that view and a collapse of the ideal of uh, meaningful equality. On the question of... Um, you know, what virtue or value should we go out and, and argue for and fight for and espouse? I mean, I, I don't think this is the right conference to provide you with that stuff. I mean, we can discuss virtues and values, and I, I, I agree with some of the values put forward by Evan, you know, particularly freedom, um, not so much environmentalism. Um, uh, and, uh, but I think, you know, this is not the alpha course. This is not a place where you come to be told and immediately enlightened, and then you go off and, and convince everyone else. It, you know, there's a pro these things can't be magicked out of thin air. There's a process, a debating process, which needs to be free and open and as rigorous as possible. Just finally, I think on the... Um, pull up your socks thing. I mean, I actually, normally I hate phrases like that because it presents everything as being an individual problem, but I have some sympathy with, with Luke, actually. I mean, I don't agree with his idea that positive thinking is this amazingly wonderful thing that can change the world on its own, but today we do face both an objective and a subjective problem, which are obviously interrelated. There's an objective problem, which is that the eco economy is collapsing, but there's also the subjective problem of a lack of leadership and a lack of vision, and a lack of political will, which means that nothing is being done about these problems. So I think pull up your socks is actually not too bad a slogan, uh, and we do need to have a bit more uh, uh, optimism and serious debate about where we're going to go next. Um, one of the things that's worth asking as I go out to the audience is just this idea about what it is apparently we're depressed or pessimistic about, um, because one of the things that informed this discussion was that People seem to have become pessimistic and depressed about humans and about what we've done. So we don't become problem solvers, but we are the people who are blamed for creating all the problems. Very much, actually, as was expressed by our anti-pizza um, contributor, which is that, you know, you're, you're saying we're all great and everything, but we're not. We're shit. We've created all these problems and we're going to doom and gloom. No, I know, I'm caricaturing... He can, he can go, but the audience know what I mean. And it is Claire Fox. Yeah, exactly. That, they're used to me. Um, but the point is, that is a kind of way that this is discussed regularly. And so it's, I think, it's just, I don't, you know, it's not a personality trait. Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? It depends what you're optimistic or pessimistic about, is my point. Okay. Um, who else can I caricature in the audience? Right. Um, okay. So that, uh, that person there, that lady there, just there. And then there's a hand right at the very back then. That I'll, uh, can we get the microphone to? Well, I'm, I'm quite uh, amazed actually. Coming from Germany, I always thought we were the greenest country in the world. And I must say in the course of this conference and in particular also in this session, I get the impression that uh, environmentalism has taken an incredibly deep hold on, on the British 
political and social imagination. And so I find myself in this awkward position of having this desire to repeat some fairly basic truth. Um, what's been called into question repeatedly in this discussion by, by different um, contributors, mainly from the floor, is that economic growth is somehow relevant uh, to human well-being and uh, uh, you know, a good life. Well, I would really like to say that is nonsense to look at it that way. What we uh, cherish today, the kind of freedom we live in, the kind of ability to you know, um, lead open and experimental lives, uh, to be active in different spheres in the arts, uh, as intellectuals or whatever we want to do, all of that depends on a hell of a lot of economic growth. And um, the trouble we face as a society at the moment is that this uh, um, foundation of our well-being is really called into question by the uh, stagnating or even um, uh, depressed condition of, of the Western economies. And I do think that if we're talking about the kind of values uh, we want today, and I would say freedom is the greatest value, but we have to understand that freedom is conditional on economic growth. And um, so if I have uh, any recommendation to make, I think we have to have this pro, um, I, I do think this pulling your socks up thing, I agree also, is, is not a bad kind of motto for our time because it means we do have to look at how we want to you know, maintain and where possible expand that foundation for human freedom here and, and in other places in the world. Okay, thanks. So the, the person right at the back, and then I forgot these two gentlemen at the front, so I'm coming to them next, and then sure. I'll go out, to, and then yeah, you and you. Yeah, okay. yes. yeah hi. Um, sorry, I was just uh, replying to the question of uh, economic growth. I mean, <laughs> economics attempts to address the scarcity of resources. So essentially, we do need economic growth. It's not debatable. It is irrespective of what your ideology is. The economy needs to grow. The question is um, whether we can uh, grow the economy sustainably. Moving on to a second thing, which, uh, <clears throat> sorry, irresponsibly, but I think the question I wanted to bring uh, forward, which um, has been touched on by a lot of the people back there, um, concerns leadership and political will. Um, there's been a lot of commentary at the moment regarding how um, celebrity is actually coming to define um, the perception of how a lot of people in the United Kingdom perceive themselves. Not only 16, 17 year olds, you know, reading. Um, you know, any of these magazines, but essentially um, everybody, including the politicians, as you mentioned, when John Lamley came over to Parliament. So the question is, if, if um, all the politicians are being fitted in a celebrity straitjacket, mm -hmm. yes, um, to, um, how can you see um, ever being a, a situation where the politicians themselves will be strong enough to actually define policies and have new ideas and ideologies that can actually transform the economy from where we are now to actually create perhaps um, you know, a better and uh, more sustainable economy than we have presently. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, these two gentlemen here, then that person, yes, you. Then. Yeah, I just wanted to, one crisis I think that we haven't mentioned so far, maybe a, a, an, obviously a financial crisis, an economic crisis, a political crisis, but there's also a crisis in the media in this country. And um, I think we've seen a continual dumbing down of our, of our press and of our media. I mean, if they're not tabloid in size, certainly most of them, apart from the FT, are tabloid in content. Um, we've seen the big debate, and it should be bigger, over our public service broadcaster, who basically seems to be far more con uh, intent on pursuing ratings than pursuing quality. If there's one virtue I'd like to see after the recession, it's quality over quantity. And actually, this is why I don't think we're having a real debate in the country over uh, the post-recession. I mean, Adair Turner's important speech uh, about which parts of financial services are useful and not socially useful has basically been lost. You know, if we really had a quality press, uh, then I think there would be a much better debate and a much wider debate. I mean, journalists seem obsessed with politicians' expenses. That's perhaps because they're so good at fiddling their own. But it would be much better if they actually focused on these issues. And at times, real debate in this country seems to be restricted almost to the op-ed page of the FT, Radio 4, and I must say, of course, in the presence here of probably Channel 4 News. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, sir. I think it's the rate of progress that we should be talking about. And I think 
Um, the faster we progress, the less we indulge our selfless side. Taking up Susan's point, I think selflessness, a certain amount of it, makes us happy. And there's therefore a component in optimism. And uh, finally, I fear that women-only lists will drive us to pro progress too fast. Thank you for that. Um, right, okay, um, now, so, hold on. There's that, that person in the middle. Stand up, the person in the middle, because you know who I mean. Yes, you. Yes. Um, I have a question for Brendan. <laughs> yeah. He, he gave me the impression that he um, thought that um, unrestrained greed didn't actually um, affect uh, social cohesion at all, that it wasn't in any, in at least a contributor to the destructions that he mentioned. Fine, yeah. And then the person, sorry, that person there then. Yeah. Hi, I'd just like to pursue a bit Brendan's tack of, of pushing ourselves a bit more to try and work out what's different about the reaction to this recession, whether it's over, obviously not, not over. Um, because obviously looks right in saying that you know recessions are no new thing and business cycle hasn't been abolished and so on. But I think we can I think we can see some uh, quite profound differences in the way society and the political elite are responding to this particular recession than those in the past. Um, I mean there is clearly, as many people have said, you know the the the, the, the reinforcement of the sense of restraint. And I think this whole discussion that you and raised about you know what does it mean about returning to the past or not returning to the past? I think the undercurrent in that discussion. Um, about, you know, we cannot go back to the way things are is very much a sense that we have to have a more restrained view of the world. But on top of that, there's another uh, feature which, uh, you know, strikes me in some ways as more worrying, which is just the lack of any sense of that anything can be done about it, the sense of the sort of the fatalism about it. Because if you look, look at other, you know, previous recessions or the big ones, you know, if you look at the 1930s, it spawned the idea of, you know, a Keynesian mixed economy, the idea of international economic cooperation. Even if you look at the 1970s and the early 80s, it spawned ideas of monetarism and of, you know, some sort of, even if it was many rhetorical attempt to try to change the way things were. What strikes me at the moment is just the sense of uh, the sense of sort of fatalism that really very little can be uh, very little can be done about things. Um, you know, you have Keynesianism refreshed again, but almost as soon as you have that discussion, it's clear there's no enthusiasm for it, and the discussion immediately goes on to how quickly can we exit from these Keynesian policies. There's no there's no great there's no great uh, ambition in terms of trying to learn any lessons. And it's almost as if whenever. Uh, you know, you have the GDP figures coming out in America, there's a sort of sigh of relief, oh, thank goodness for that, you know, we're moving back to uh, something like normality or whatever. Perhaps we don't have to do so much anymore, perhaps we can turn off the fiscal spending and so on. And it's that fatalism, that sort of a lack of any incentive to see that something needs to be done, which I think is most worrying, because although, while some of the things we could probably have big arguments about, at least it'd be good to have arguments about the sort of post-recession ideas that people had. At the moment, it's the, 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 the extent of political exhaustion, which I think is the most challenging thing. Right, panel, so I've got, um, I'm gonna come to, I've got four hands, right? But is there one sentence anyone wants to say? Anyone want to do a quick one sentence at this point? We have me? Any one sentences? No, fine. Okay, so uh, that's fine. Um, that that gentleman there, then there, then there. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's just a very quick one. Um, kind of a crazy idea, really. Um, we're all getting quite miserable about the current times, but there's also some good things as well. Um, I, I'm always very impressed by the open source software community, for instance. So basically, people work sometimes for years on end, um, doing very elaborate programs, which they just just give away, source code and all. And it's very collaborative. There's no sort of like um, profits made. Uh, so my question was this was, anything else we can open source? Any other areas we can just give stuff away and combine our efforts for free? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes, then there. Uh, Dennis Hayes. I, I just want to take issue with uh, Brendan, actually, because... Um, I like Mark's question about values, and there is a danger in just saying, let's just argue, because in a, a therapeutic culture, right, argument can become almost pointless. And one of the real benefits of real argument is some people are experiencing today that uh, Socratic apora, you know, you're terribly depressed because you don't know what to think, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. 
But I think the one value you could put forward, and it's Claire who's saying that people won't advocate anything, and Philip Reef makes the point when he's writing about the therapeutic culture, that what you need is people to actually advocate their ideas. Because there's no point in having freedom of speech if people won't put forward their arguments. And as Frank said in the beginning session, teachers who want to defend their subject won't stand up and say it. So the great thing about having the value of freedom of speech, which is a value that we should support, absolute freedom of speech, and that's a, a something else, but also, and the point of that, is you then advocate whatever it is you want to advocate, and we can have the discussions. Because without the A, so if we're going to have an alpha outcome to this, it should be A for advocacy. Okay, thank you. Yes, two, yeah. Got a whole, yeah, so, so that lady at the net, yeah, you, and then I've got two more. Yeah. Well, I think my point links very well to that, because the thing about the question about what virtues and values we should be advocating, if we don't have that sense of advocacy and content, what you have is the incursion of positive psychology, which defines virtues, I don't know whether they're virtues or values, as stoicism, altruism, resilience, optimism and being in the moment turns them into psychological traits or skills and then governments start to say we can train people to feel or have those virtues or skills or traits or whatever they are so without content and argument you have uh, psychological training in the name of emotional well-being uh, the RSA is very interested in this through things like the social brain and that's what governments start to do to replace debate and content and ways forward yeah. that's definitely one of the things the RSA get completely wrong Luke just for you to note um, right anyway yes uh, that lady there yeah um, yes I'm I'm a bit I'm slightly confused about why I thought that Luke started off by saying, answering the question about what virtues um, we needed, because he said optimism, and I think that surely optimism in the sense of um, optimism about humanity, faith in people and trust in people are the virtues that we need to promote nowadays, partly because um, there is such a mood of doom and gloom throughout society today about what humans are capable of, and the only real kind of um, thing that seems to be getting more and more popular today is the most negative thing, i.e. environmentalism, which is, you know, just basically is all about how how you should live if you really believe that human, human beings are, you know, a, a blight upon the planet. And I, I, it seemed to, me, to me, it seems completely obvious that um, in the same way that, as we all know, if you smile, the, the world smiles with you. I don't want to be trite about this, but um, I, thought, I, thought, I thought Luke's point about optimism, if you apply it to being optimistic about humanity, is, is really, imp is, you know, is, is completely key in terms of us needing a new humanism. And because of that, I was a bit, I, maybe I misunderstood you, Luke, but when you came back on, on thinking about the pizzas, I thought, I'm surprised that when you go on about optimism so lyrically and articulately, that you're so pessimistic about any alternative to the market, because I'd have thought you would think, my goodness, what a waste this society makes of so much human potential. This is really stupid. Surely we can do better than that. Surely we should be more optimistic about what's possible and what's, what we can, you know, a society that's, that's prone to periodic crises that tend to live in, li, li, end in world wars, seems to me, why are you, why are you, why are you so negative about you know, any alternative to that? So. Okay, thank you. And then the person next to you. Oh, sorry, a bit of a clap. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think there are good pizzas and bad pizzas, and your opinion on it kind of depends. I mean, just, just after the recession started, there was a, a comment piece on the papers, and she was kind of arguing against the cuts on funding in libraries. And she said, you know, in a recession, what we need are libraries and gardens. And, you know, I mean, maybe you might not agree with it. I'm not so keen on gardens. But, you know, the, the point she was making was that you make a choice about what's worth it. And there is decadence in our society, and decadence is basically waste and uh, resources and energy that's put to, uh, to no end. And that, that is rife. What I hoped with the recession was that we could actually have a critique of decadence and work out which bits aren't worth it. But I found almost the opposite. Like, all my kind of, all the really decadent parts of, of the state as we seem to have kind of sailed on through, um, blemished. In the meantime, there are cuts in funding for the useful parts um, uh, of, of, you know, of libraries and, and, and health system and that kind of thing. So, I mean, I think that we, you know, we do need a critique of waste. And Benjamin Franklin, his motto was do something useful today. And I think that's a good motto for those in public service, a good motto for everyone else as well. And just a critique of decadence. I think Brendan's right that, that, that there is no, there's no capacity to do that now. How, how are these books called enough at the moment? Not enough with an exclamation mark. And you think, well, enough what? And you look and it's enough everything, you know, enough, enough of this, enough of that, enough of actually living, enough of actually acting. And they kind of say, you know, the, th the trouble is well, we all want more 
always. We want more. We want more of life. And so there is a kind of critique, which is not critique of a particular kind of decadence, but critique of activity in general. Um, and I think we actually kind of need to needs to be more, make more of a judgment about what, what activity is useful and what activity is not, and focus on the stuff that is useful. Uh, thank you. And then, uh, yes, I saw one, yes, that gentleman, that gentleman there. Is there anyone else? Then I'm going to take the final comments in the panel. I've got this gentleman here. Is that it? Are we happy? Right, okay, this gentleman here. Yeah, just in terms of um, trying to understand the reasons for the, the sort of mood of pessimism, just wondering whether that might be partly explicable by a sort of certain lack of historical perspective. So, I mean, we keep being told, uh, rightly, that in statistical terms, that the current recession is the worst since the 1930s. But actually, if you look at the impact that it's having on people's lives, it doesn't quite feel as bad as um, what happened to people in, uh, in the 1930s or even in the 1980s, which uh, I'm old enough to remember. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we get all this stuff coming from the media about what a terrible recession it is, and maybe that's making people feel pessimistic and gloomy. And maybe people have just forgotten um, what it used to be like um, in the past. And uh, allied to that, I think perhaps a sort of uh, almost sort of lack of uh, critical faculty, or some people seem to be losing their critical faculties and seeing all kinds of risks and dangers out there from. Um, all kinds of, you know, paedophiles and things like that, and p p perceiving all kinds of dangers which are out of proportion to the reality, and I wonder where that sort of l lack of critical thinking is coming from. Um, and if you're, if you're wondering um, what kind of virtues you should be displaying, well, um, you have got about 2,000 years' worth of literature to go and look at and, you know, have a th bit of a think about. Okay, nice. A nice urge to read the classics there at the end. Good. Um, now I've got to say something, because obviously I have to. Um, I, well, I, just, um, I just want to reflect on a couple of things that I would have said if I was in the audience. Um, the, the issue about fatalism, it seems to me, to be a very profound sense of fatalism at the moment. It's kind of really weird, because it's a kind of post-religious fatalism, but it feels not dissimilar. Well, in fact, actually, I, I think I, I felt slightly more freedom as a kind of uh, traditional Catholic and then the kind of fatalism that's imposed on us at the moment in a bizarre way. Um, this is what I was having a go at Luke. It's not Luke's fault. It's, uh, um, it's just that there's a, this whole neuroscience thing and the RSA are really pushing this, but it really is this sort of idea that we are no more than our kind of, you know, if we study the brain and uh, neuroscience developments, we can actually uh, understand humanity, as though choice is not part of it, as though we're kind of just simply uh, scientific uh, machines in some ways. And the kind of growth of COD psychology, uh, we discussed the whole nudge-nudge thesis this morning, kind of manipulating people to make sure they make the right choices, as though we're kind of hapless uh, inf infants that kind of can be... Uh, uh, anyway, all of that sort of stuff. And I do feel that part of the... A problem in response to the recession is that it's been done to us by someone else, as though we've got no solutions to it. And I do feel that very profoundly. The other thing is I think there's a massive assault on reason. Um, you know, the idea that we can actually solve the problems facing humanity is completely undermined by both that fatalism and the concepts of, for example, uh, um, uh, economic uh, uh, behaviorism and so on that kind of suggests, oh no, we're all irrational and uh, we can't, this constantly told that we can't um, actually uh, solve any problems. And my final thing is just on freedom. I mean, I do think that um, uh, a precondition for liberty to really exist beyond it as an idea, it has to be a greater economic prosperity and economic growth. Um, the thing that's most in interesting about at the moment, though, is, is that people now explicitly in this country say that the recession proves that we've had too much economic, unrestrained economic growth, and that's not sustainable. And the way that we resolve this is to restrain people's freedom in order to solve it. That's what's our sustainable development means denying people certain freedoms. We will actually be stopped doing certain things because if we're let free uh, choice, if you just let us choose, then we're bound to do something that will be bad for the environment, bad for the planet, bad for the neighbours, bad for somebody. And therefore, it's an argument against freedom that's come out as one of the post-recession virtues that I want to absolutely reject. So I do think we have to fight for freedom, but we have to recognise that that will mean that we have to fight for unrestrained economic growth, which I'm actually rather enthusiastic about, even though it's not the only uh, value I want. Okay, over to the panel. Anyone want to say anything? Um, Luke, do you want to give us your final thoughts? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I defended the market. It's clearly an imperfect system, but I think it's the best voting mechanism that's ever been devised in terms of distributing resources and allowing experiment. And essentially what you've had in a recession is the creative destruction, which in a way clears up misallocation and it's painful, but it's necessary if we are to allocate resources more optimally. Um, and the question on the media, unquestionably, the content industries are suffering a crisis of morale. As it happens, I think things are not nearly as bad as one might imagine. I think there's huge amounts still of quality information being distributed because, in a sense, now in an English-speaking nation like this, for example, you can access all the US news media for nothing. So thanks to the global online in, uh, revolution, there is actually, for the consumer, more news and information than ever before. So I'm not sure things are as bad as all that, actually. Okay, thanks, Susan. Well, I've got a lot to say, so I'll, but I'm just going to try and do it in bullet points because uh, there have been a lot of things said that I deeply disagree with um, or in one case would like to put slightly differently. Thank you to the gentleman who quoted me, but I wasn't exactly talking about selflessness or altruism. I was simply talking about devotion to something beyond one's own immediate welfare. And I agree, with, which it's a... It's, um, it's a vocabulary difference, but I think it's an important one um, because selflessness implies a kind of asceticism and renunciation that I'm not talking about. I, I agree with you, though, that the right kind of devotion um, creates both a, a, a sense of optimism and makes us happy. So um, with that caveat, um, a number of people have implied that at least I was suggesting that economic growth somehow was a bad thing. Um, of course, I don't say that, but I did very, I agree that economic growth is a precondition for freedom. It's a precondition, um, as Claire just put it, but it's not the same thing. And I think it's terribly misleading to suggest that they're the same. It's not just about sustainable growth, which I think is extremely important. It's about thinking what else does progress consist in? Um, neuroscience, Claire, again, I'm sure we could do a whole panel on this, but what puzzles me about that as a source of pessimism is that the, the bit that I know about it not only doesn't undermine the idea of freedom and creativity, what neuroscience can now do is light, show which parts of our brain light up when this or that happens. Well, that's lovely. It's not clear that it explains anything, and moreover, the explanatory bit is really quite um, hopeful for those of us who believe in the power of ideas. That is, our brains change depending on our, they physically change, depending on our experiences, depending on our ideas, and depending on what's happened to them, in a way that, you know, the most Hegelian idealist could only dream of. So I actually don't see anything yet in neuroscience that's a cause for pessimism. What I wonder if you ought to think about, and now I'm speaking as American, speaking to um, an audience of, of Brits, um, who are talking about local politics in ways that I don't follow, um, uh, you know, only to a certain extent. But I wonder if, I mean, the economic crisis happened to everybody all over the world without anybody, as far as I know, really understanding who was responsible for it or even which mechanisms. We know a bit about it. So, yes, all of us have the feeling, and I, I speak for people who know more about economics than I do, that something happened that was way out of our control. But that's not a problem about here. I wonder if you're not a bit fatalist uh, or depressed about the fact that Britain made a major foreign policy mistake that was uh, caused by the last president of my country. And it's not clear how much you were, I mean, I. I have to take responsibility as a citizen, even though I did what I could to oppose George W. Bush um, for eight years. But it's, in a certain sense, it's less your responsibility than it was mine. You guys were out on the streets and telling Tony Blair what you wanted, and um, yeah. So um, something awful happened that was not entirely in your control. Last point. 
The man who um, has been sort of uh, looking good-natured about being teased about pizza um, has, I think, not gotten enough of a hearing. Of course, there's nothing wrong with pizza, although it really does depend on the pizza. But I think it's absolutely... <laughs> I think it's absolutely self-deceptive to say that you vote with the market is the best voting mechanism that exists when not just in developing countries but you know in Europe and the United States what's out there is not under my control and I think you're absolutely right to say that what's out there and available to buy or not buy um, about half of it is garbage. It's really garbage. And that's something that creates um, on, among workers who are producing garbage uh, to the sense that, as a matter of fact, their lives are not devoted to um, producing stuff that one could be proud of and satisfied to have done a day's work with, but producing plastic shit. Um, so I think it's, it's really important that the people who are involved in entrepreneurial enterprises, the people involved in politics acknowledge, wait a second, the market isn't a voting mechanism. I mean, it's a voting mechanism like, uh, you know, I, I, I gather as of today, there'll be an election in Afghanistan, but there's only one candidate, so <laughs> hey. Okay, thanks, Susan. Um, listen, um, I... I've overrun, so if people can... No, I, it's my fault, but um, because everyone's so interesting. But Evan, if you can kind of Very speedily... I, I agree with the gentleman in the black jacket who spoke there, and uh, I can't have, didn't have time to say why. I want to retreat a little on my attack on celebrity, because actually, because there's a different sort of problem. Joanna Lumley was, was absolutely fabulous in what she did and how she did it, and we wouldn't have defeated the religious hatred law as it was without Rowan Atkinson, who was a celebrity of great capacity to actually deliver a political argument. The real problems are not even the Esther Ransons, but the Rupert Murdochs of this world, individuals with far too much influence as individuals. Uh, greed, I think, I'll put my, I'll nail my colours to the mask, greed is bad, and, and ostentatious greed and lavish living is bad, and there's evidence that countries which are more equal are A, happier, and B, have, and maybe it's associated, fewer problems to do with crime and health. So when you have gross disparity of people living next to each other in, for example, Johannesburg, but you see it in this country as well, that's where the problems come from. So it is reasonable, I think, and evidenced to say that lavish, life, uh, lavish lifestyles are to be deprecated, uh, if we can, within the constraints of freedom. I want to agree with whoever said that risk aversion is a real problem, the vetting and barring, we should get rid of that, and sell-by dates and vaccine scares and pill scares. And the crisis in the media, actually, is one of intolerance. It was mentioned in another session, but the, you know, the, 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 we, we've seen replicated the Christian protests against Jerry Springer, the opera. These are people who, whose thumbs don't work to switch over the television. is replicated in the, in, by people who complained without seeing the, the ridiculous, but nevertheless legitimate, Jan Moore article on Stephen Gately. And the, the only crumb of comfort in that was the Daily Mail was being pilloried by people who hadn't read what they were complaining about, <laughs> just like the Daily Mail did with Brand Ross and, and so forth. And finally, I am, I, I'm an optimist. The fact that, I, the fact that I, I dwell on negatives doesn't mean that I'm a pessimist. It means that I see challenges. I'm a liberal Democrat, which means I must be optimistic. And, and the, the, the point I'm making, the, the best way of explaining this, I think, is, to, is also from, from Annie Hall, where he talks about the two women at the Catskill Mountain Resort. And one of them says to the other, gee, the food here is really terrible, isn't it? And the other one says, yes, and such small portions. <laughs> and, and if you can think about the size of the portion and try and constructively do something about our lot, then I think that's optimistic, not pessimistic. OK, thank you. Brendan? Um, I, I'm all in favour of criticising decadence, but I think it's a mistake to believe or to argue that decadence is the cause of the problems that we face rather than being a product of... Uh, broader problems that exist. And there are two problems, I think, with focusing on kind of unrestrained greed and decadence as the key problem. The first is that it's intellectually lazy because it overlooks the, why financial speculation plays such a key role in the West today and, and how it's built on a broader kind of decline. 
And the other problem with it is that it's now being spread out. So it's not just the banker's decadence that is criticised, but the decadence of society in general. That's why you have more and more commentators saying that we should now embrace thriftiness, because for a middle-class commentator, thriftiness is probably quite a nice thing. You know, you kind of make stuff and have hand-me-downs, but for the larger population, thriftiness is not a very nice thing. So there is a problem with kind of... Uh, pointing the finger too much at decadence. Uh, in terms of the values uh, and what values we should espouse post-recession and so on, uh, you know, I, I want to echo uh, Karl Marx. You know, we can create the new world through ruthless criticism of the old. And there's one <coughs> value that exists today which I would just want to challenge uh, to end with, which is sustainability and this idea of sustainable growth, which is one of my bugbears, because it really is a roundabout, sometimes very dishonest way of kind of denigrating growth itself. It's also a very sly buzzword because it's impossible to challenge. It forces people like me to say, oh, I want unsustainable growth, which is obviously a terrible thing. But more importantly than that, it speaks to a changed view of humanity. You know, throughout history, right from Genesis through to the Enlightenment, when Francis Bacon said, let's put nature on the rack and torture its secrets from her, uh, there has been an idea that humans were in control of the planet and the environment. Now there's this idea that we're just visitors here, or even worse, we're parasites, and we have to kind of look after everything and be really careful and tiptoe around. In other words, we're pollutants. So that speaks to the kind of moral denigration of human beings. So I want to challenge sustainability. That's one value we should leave behind. And just, I want to echo Claire, the two things I know we need more of are freedom and prosperity, and the discussion can start now about how we go about getting those things. Okay, can we thank our panel, please? Yeah.